All right. Uh, hello, everyone. Well, thank you so much for a very generous introduction. I hope you can all see me, see me and hear me OK. Um, someone will let me know if you can't. Uh, I'll go ahead and share my screen, and we can get started. Um, so uh, I want to talk today about some, some unpublished work uh, for my group that, that I hope will have relevance for, for some of you, especially uh, if you're working in the single cell community um, and working maybe with single cell RNA-seq, but also uh, potentially with other uh, uh, potentially exciting uh, uh, data types. Um, so I'm sure you've heard uh, at this meeting and, and, and many other venues uh, quite a lot of single cell talks recently. And I think one of the trends uh, that's become increasingly exciting uh, in the single cell field is the emergence of sort of well-curated reference maps uh, or atlases, uh, for example, from, from different tissues. Um, so of course, many of you are very familiar with the Human Cell Atlas Initiative, which is a large international consortium aiming to construct these reference maps uh, across the human body. Uh, and to build comprehensive lists of, of cell types and, and their molecular states in health and disease. Uh, my group is in, uh, very involved in the parallel initiative, the Human Biomolecular Atlas Project, or HubMap. Uh, and as part of HubMap, we've uh, developed this tool called Azimuth. Uh, and we envision Azimuth as kind of being like a BLAST-like tool, uh, but for single cell data. Uh, so the idea is like, you know, with BLAST, you go to a web page, you type in your genomic sequence, and it automatically maps it uh, to a reference. Uh, we want to do the same thing for single cell data. So you can go to this webpage, uh, azimuth.hubmapconsortium.org. Uh, you can upload just a counts matrix, an unpro uh, unnormalized counts matrix of your single cell experiment, uh, and it will map that data set uh, rapidly uh, to one of our uh, references in the human body. And when you do that mapping, uh, you automatically process uh, and analyze that data set. Uh, you automatically annotate um, each one of your cells, uh, and you automatically visualize and compute differentially expressed genes um, for all the different cell types uh, that are present in your sample. Um, so the idea is instead of doing, you know, very long manual uh, reference, uh, uh, sort of unsupervised clustering and annotation, uh, reference mapping can completely change uh, the way that we, we interact with single cell data. Uh, it's fully automated, it's fast, uh, and it benefits from these ex extensive um, uh, existing references that have already been curated uh, by these large consortia. Um, so I like to say that the existence of a reference, it, it completely changes the way that we interact with data. And that, that's, of course, true for the genome as well. Uh, I've done genomics, you know, now for, for 20 years, and I've, I've never in my life, I've never assembled a genome. I've always mapped new data onto a pre-built -pre genomic reference. Uh, and maybe in the same way, you know, uh, maybe my graduate student or one of my, my graduate students' graduate student uh, will never do unsupervised clustering of single cell data. Uh, they will always map uh, to reference data sets uh, once those computational tools and those reference data sets uh, become more mature. So I think this is a very exciting trend for the field, and, and many of you are already using this. One of the challenges, though, for reference mapping is that right now, almost all, in fact, really all of the existing reference mapping tools are exclusively for single cell RNA-seq. Uh, and of course, you know, we want to move beyond uh, RNA as we start thinking about understanding uh, cellular dynamics and cellular behaviors. There are many, many things that we care about um, in single cells. Of course, many of you are familiar with single cell ataxic, uh, which tells us something about the chromatin state or chromatin accessibility of individual cells. But there's quite a wide variety of modalities that we're interested in, genomic heterogeneity, heterogeneity in DNA methylation, uh, protein abundance heterogeneity, and of course, variation also in spatial position um, and lineage as well. So all of these sort of cellular modalities are things that we're interested in. And one of the goals broadly for my group uh, is to take some of the tools uh, and, and resources that we've developed uh, for single cell RNA-seq, uh, but to be able to fill in information uh, on the missing gaps and modalities as well, so that we're not just having a gene expression focused view of the cell, but really a more holistic view of its overall uh, molecular and phenotypic state. So to do that, uh, we need to be able to measure information from other modalities uh, and also integrate that together. Um, and I like to, to joke sometimes that what we really are, are kind of hope, what we would really love to have as a community um, is a technology that, that currently does not exist. Um, and that technology uh, would be able to simultaneously profile a complete spectrum of cellular modalities. So from the same cell, we'd be able to measure chromatin accessibility, genome, DNA methylation, genome organization like Hi-C, the presence of hit multiple histone modifications, of course, the transcriptome, and also the abundances of surface and intracellular proteins. Um, since we're wishing for things, uh, that technology should be scalable. It should be high throughput. Um, anybody should be able to run this. Um, and importantly, uh, even though we're measuring multiple things at the same time, we should be able to preserve the optimal data quality for each modality. Um, so this is a very, very bold wish list. And, and of course, this technology uh, is not feasible. Um, so we need to find alternatives that will enable us to be able to, to integrate all of these different data types together, um, even if we can't necessarily measure it all at the same time. And that's what I want to tell you about today. 
Um, so my, my group is, is interested in, in developing both experimental and computational solutions towards this problem. I want to very briefly introduce an experimental solution, uh, and then I'll tell you about some new computational methods we've designed. Um, the experimental solution uh, really stems from a technology uh, that was developed here at the New York Genome Center uh, by the Technology De uh, Development Lab uh, and, and uh, Innovation Lab in collaboration with my lab called SiteSeq. Uh, SiteSeq is a technology for being able to measure RNA and protein levels simultaneously in single cells. Um, and SiteC works by having pro, uh, antibodies that are specific to proteins of interest and by placing uh, barcodes on those antibodies that can be captured alongside single uh, cell RNA-seq. So by sequencing those, those DNA, those barcoded oligos, uh, you can sort of uh, estimate the, the abundance of individual uh, proteins in a cell um, at the same time while also measuring the transcriptome. So SiteC is a technology that, that lets us measure RNA and protein together in single cells. And actually, over the last few years, we've developed a series of extensions to SiteSeq. These include technologies like ASAP-Seq, which lets you measure chromatin accessibility and proteins in single cells. Uh, and more recently, uh, the Single Cell Cut and Tag Pro technology, which allows us to measure histone modifications or, or uh, DNA protein interactions um, and cell surface proteins also in single cells. So we have all these different technologies that each measure something different but they all allow us to measure the same panel of proteins across different experiments. And what that enables us to do is to collect information from different modalities uh, in different experiments, but then to integrate them seamlessly together on the basis of these shared uh, protein information profiles that we can gather from all of these technologies. Um, so you know, in a single sort of harmonized analysis, we can collect 10 different molecular modalities. And even though they were, they were measured in different cells, they can be seamlessly integrated together based on these protein measurements. Um, so this is really rich data. This is an example of a, of a type of uh, a locus that we can explore. This is the CD8 locus um, in, in human blood cells. Um, you can see that we have all sorts of different types of molecular information that's all been harmonized together. Um, we have RNA and protein measurements. You can see that, that those modalities are upregulated specifically in CD8 T cells. But we also have chromatin accessibility, the presence of enhancer and promoter marks, uh, Paul II binding, all sorts of modalities that have all been integrated together through these protein measurements. So I won't talk about this work further, um, in particular because obviously Gustavo, a postdoc in my lab, he's led uh, all of these analyses. We'll be giving a talk later in this session. Um, but this is an exciting experimental solution for doing widespread uh, multimodal data integration. And, and that solution really relies on the fact that in multiple experiments, we can measure the same things, for example, the same panel of cell surface proteins. Uh, but that's kind of a, you know, it's kind of a, a niche approach. Uh, you know, it raises this really interesting computational question of how can we map data sets and integrate data sets when they actually measure different things? Um, so as an example, uh, we recently built an azimuth reference of human bone marrow. So this is, of course, a very fascinating system that encompasses um, the entire developing human immune system. Uh, you can see a, a UMAP here that consists of quite a wide variety of cell states encompassing both uh, differentiated cell types um, but also a wide variety of very carefully curated and annotated progenitor lineages, um, starting from hematopoietic stem cells uh, and then differentiating into a wide variety of downstream immune cell types. Um, so, you know, this, this reference actually is quite comprehensive. Um, we integrated data, um, single cell RNA-seq data from uh, a wide variety of data sets in the literature. There are hundreds of individuals that are represented here. Uh, and we have a very comprehensive list of cell types that we've come up with. So that's great if you, if you have your own single cell RNA-seq data set from the bone marrow, you can map it onto this reference. But what if you're using a different technology? Uh, so for example, the Greenleaf Lab published a very nice single cell attack seq data set uh, from the bone marrow, which is very valuable because it can help us understand chromatin state changes over the process of differentiation. Um, but of course, we're measuring different things. We, when we do single cell RNA-seq, we're measuring genes in single cells. When we do single cell attack seq, we're measuring peaks. So you know, how can we integrate these data sets together when fundamentally we've measured uh, different things? Now, uh, a few years ago, my, my group uh, introduced an initial solution to this problem, along with uh, others, including Josh Welch and Evan McCosco, um, for being able to integrate RNA-seq and ATAC-seq data. Um, and basically, we, we introduced kind of a, a pretty simple trick that makes a very strong assumption. We assume that if a gene is accessible at the chromatin access in, in chromatin accessibility, then it's also likely to be transcribed. And so what we can do is we can sum up all of the reads from a ATAC-seq uh, experiment uh, along the gene body, and we, we call those gene activity scores, and they're sort of rough estimates of gene expression. Um, so we can now integrate, uh, we're kind of pretending now that we're measuring the same things because uh, we've converted basically a taxi data into gene expression. Uh, but this is a very basic approach. Um, it makes a very strong assumption that open chromatin corresponds to active transcription. Um, that's certainly not true in differentiating systems where of course there's gonna be a lag between changes in chromatin accessibility and the activation of gene expression. 
Um, so this method kind of works okay, um, and it works okay, especially in developed systems, uh, but it really is kind of an initial pass, um, and it's not particularly high resolution, especially when we want to work on developing or transitioning systems. So what I want, what I want to tell you about today is an alternative computational approach um, for integrating across modalities. Uh, so this work is on BioArchive, um, uh, currently in revision. Uh, so you're welcome to, to read about the preprint online and, uh, for, for a full description of the method. Uh, but you can also try out this approach if you'd like uh, for yourself. Uh, we have a full, uh, this, this is implemented as part of my lab's uh, Surat package, and we have tutorials and vignettes um, that you can easily access uh, on my lab's uh, website if you'd like to try this, uh, for example, on your own single cell ataxic data sets. All right, so before I kind of tell you how, you, how we do this, um, again, our goal is to integrate data sets across modalities, um, and we're gonna use a, a technique called dictionary learning, and I'm gonna introduce that um, very briefly. Um, so dictionary learning is a, is a set of techniques that's very commonly used in image analysis, um, and, and more frequently now in genomics. Uh, and the idea is that you have a data set, um, in this case, it's a, a noisy image, okay? Uh, and so what you're gonna do is you're gonna take a subset of data points in the data set, um, so like little patches, for example, um, and you can see how you know, certain patches make up small pieces, for example, of the tablecloth or of the floor or of the scarf. And that collection of patches, we're going to call that a dictionary. Okay. So then what we're going to do is we're going to take each data point and we're going to reconstruct each part of the image as a weighted sum of those dictionary elements. Uh, and if you do this reconstruction process, you can actually very accurately denoise the image. Um, so to emphasize the essence of this idea, you're learning how to represent a data set as a combination of individual data points. Um, and that, in, that collection of individual little elements uh, or data points is called a dictionary. So dictionary learning is a form of representation learning. Uh, so this is a very cool and, and powerful technique. This paper is, you know, has thousands of citations um, and is used very commonly in image analysis. And, and I'll show you kind of how we can apply it um, in our genomic context as well. All right, so the, the basic idea is that we're going to make, you know, we want to be able to map, for example, a single cell ataxy data set where we measure peaks onto a single cell RNA-seq data set where we measure genes. Um, and the way that we're gonna do this is we're gonna use a third data set, okay? It can be a small one, but a third data set, where we measure RNA and attack together. Uh, for example, using the 10X multi-ohm technology that enables simultaneous measurement of RNA-seq and attack-seq profiles. Uh, so the multi-ohm technology is, is pretty expensive. It's kind of lower throughput, but we can, you know, we can generate a few thousand cells. Um, and the idea is that we're gonna use this multi-omic data set as a bridge to be able to map our ataxy data set onto our RNA-seq reference. And, and that's why we call this bridge integration. Um, so I'll show you kind of now how, how the dictionary learning comes in. Okay, so remember that dictionary learning, the idea is to represent a data set based on a combination of individual elements called a dictionary. So our key insight is what we're gonna do is we're gonna treat each cell in the multiomic data set as a dictionary element, okay? So the multiomic data set, that's the bridge, that's the dictionary, and each cell is a dictionary element. So what we can do is for each RNA-seq cell in the single cell RNA-seq experiment, we're gonna represent that cell as a weighted combination of dictionary elements, okay? And we can do that because the multi-ohm cells, they each measure genome-wide RNA expression. So we can, we, can, uh, we can do that representation. Now, the single cell ataxic data sets, we're gonna represent each cell again as a weighted combination of the same dictionary elements. And again, we can do that because the multi-ohm cells also measure ataxic. So the trick is that we can take the single cell RNA-seq and the single cell ataxic data sets, and we can represent them by the same dictionary. And so by doing that, we've now, even though they originally measured different things, we've transformed those data sets so they're represented in the same space. And once they're represented by the same set of features, now we can map them very readily one onto the other. All right, so you know, if you're interested in the, in the details of this, you know, of course, the, the preprint contains a full mathematical description with, with all the equations and a, and a graphical semantic you can follow along with. Um, but I'll, I'll just kind of highlight a few key points here. Uh, you know, we have an RNA-seq data set X. We have an ataxic data set Y. You can see that they measure different things. And then we have a multi-omic data set M where we measure both genes and peaks. Um, we'll go through a series of steps and I'll describe these in a little bit more detail. And at the end of the day, we want to arrive at two matrices, L sub X and L sub Y, and note that these matrices now have exactly the same, they're defined by the same features. They have the same dimensionality and they're defined by the same set of features so they can be mapped um, one onto another. Um, so again, I won't go through, through this whole procedure, but I do want to highlight two of the key steps that we think are especially important. Uh, the goal here is to give you a little bit of intuition, uh, especially if you decide to, to read, through the, read through the preprint uh, or try the method. All right, so the most important step is for us to learn what we call this, this dictionary representation for each modality. So for each cell in the single cell RNA-seq experiment, 
what is the optimal linear combination of multiomic profiles that will enable us to reconstruct the cell? Uh, so we want to learn these matrices D, uh, one for RNA uh, and one for RNA, uh, and one for attack. Uh, and these matrices will tell us how to combine the dictionary elements in an optimal way. Um, and the nice thing about this is it's, it's basically a matrix regression problem, right? We were trying to, to combine um, predictors to be able to optimally reconstruct an output response. And, and that's really fantastic because that has a closed form solution. Um, it's scalable, it's efficient to calculate, um, even for large data sets. Um, so that's really great for learning these dictionary representations. Um, one problem that we have, though, is that these dictionary representations are not necessarily compact. So if we have a large multiomic bridge data set, say, for example, 10,000 cells, um, then each of our D matrices will have 10,000 columns. That's actually quite large, especially as these data sets get larger and larger. Um, alternatively, if we ran PCA or something, which is another form of representation learning, um, that doesn't solve our integration problem, but that allows us to summarize each cell in just 30 to 50 columns, so a much more compact representation. Um, so we actually use a neat trick to be able to compress the dictionary representation. Uh, the trick is inspired by a technique that many of you are familiar with, known as Laplacian eigenmaps. I mean, it basically exploits the fact that in our bridge data set, you know, we have 10,000 cells, uh, but they have extensive correlation structure. Um, and we can learn that structure by computing a k-nearest neighbor graph for the multiomic data set, uh, and then calculating the graph Laplacian matrix, and then performing an eigen decomposition of that matrix, which is exactly what you do in running a Laplacian uh, eigenmaps. So we can use the resulting eigenvectors to reduce the dimensionality of our dictionary representation. Um, and so at the end of this, instead of defining each cell by 10,000 features, um, we can define each cell only by, by, by about 50 features um, with minimal information loss. And importantly, it's still the same set of 50 features that are used to define the single cell RNA-seq cells and the single cell attack-seq cells. Um, so we've still solved the problem of, of transforming uh, both these data sets into the same space. All right, so let me show you some examples of, of how this method actually works. Um, uh, this is uh, the mapping of the single cell ataxic data set. On the left is a single cell RNA-seq reference. And on the right is a single cell ataxic data set, which we've now mapped onto it. Um, so you can now see that for each of the single cell ataxic profiles, it's visualized in the same UMAP space. And more importantly, we've been able to transfer the exact same set of annotations that we had previously curated in RNA space uh, now onto the attack as well. And so that can really help us uh, to interpret this ataxic data and open the door uh, to this new modality. Now, I'll show you lots of benchmarking on ground truth data sets in a minute to show, to show you our accuracy, but I want to highlight kind of one cool result first. If you look at this mapped uh, single cell ataxic data set, you can see this kind of small cluster here circled in red um, that we've annotated as ASDC. Uh, these are some of the rarest cell populations in the data. Uh, it turns out this was actually a population that I helped to discover um, in my postdoc at the Bro with Aviv Ragav, Chloe Avalani, and Nira Cohen. Uh, it's actually a new type of dendritic cell. Um, we discovered it originally with single cell RNA seq. It's one of the rarest cell types in the blood. It probably makes up about 0.04% of cells in the blood and bone marrow. Uh, and we actually don't know exactly what these cells do. Uh, we are know we do know that they're defined very strongly by the markers Axel and Siglic C6, uh, and so we've named these cells uh, ASDC. Um, so I'm telling you that now, after bridge integration, we've been able to identify these cells in single cell ataxy data too. Uh, but how do we know that we're correct? How do we know that these cells actually are ASDC? Um, and so we can look at the cyclic C6 marker gene, um, and you can actually see that in the ataxy data, there is a unique enhancer that is only open and accessible in cells that we annotate as ASDC. Um, so that's a cool result. Um, and again, these cells are so rare that if we were just trying to cluster the ataxy data without a reference, um, it, they would have been almost impossible to find uh, without the sort of bridge integration method. All right, so I've, I've described to you that we can transfer annotations from one data set to another, but we could actually go even further than that. Um, so now what I'm doing actually is, is uh, you know, we're, we're taking uh, our, our RNA and attack seq cells, which were measured in separate experiments. But because we've been able to integrate them together, we can actually build a joint uh, differentiation trajectory, for example, starting from hematopoietic stem cells going through multiple developmental stages and ending at CD14 monocytes. And we can learn a pseudotime that jointly describes the progression of cells through both RNA and attack space. So for example, we can look now at how different genes and enhancers behave along this trajectory. We can see that the gene MPO is specifically activated when cells commit to a myeloid fate. But interestingly, the enhancer that activates MPO actually becomes accessible a little bit earlier uh, in the trajectory process. There's a lag between the activation of this enhancer and the activation of the downstream gene. That kind of lag is actually exactly what our previous methods wouldn't have been able to identify, but it's kind of cool that we can see that. Um, even though we measured RNA and attack actually in different cells, we can start to explore relationships between them. 
So this is just one example. We can ask genome wide. Can we can we identify these lags? Uh, you know, so genome wide, and actually we identify a few hundred cases uh, where the activation of gene expression lags behind the the opening of an enhancer. Uh, I'm showing you a few of these examples here. In fact, there's a very strong enrichment in those in those 300 cases uh, for genes that are involved in the cell cycle. Um, and so, actually, this is a phenomenon that we refer to as proliferation priming. You can see that there's a, a quite a number of genes that are open and accessible in hematopoietic stem cells, even if they even if they aren't being actively transcribed. They turn on later, but they're already at the earliest stages of differentiation. They're already accessible from the ataxy perspective. Um, and that's probably because it's really important these cells, when they decide to divide, they have to do that at a moment's notice. They don't have time to sort of open their chromatin. They have to be ready and poised to differentiate. Um, and this ability to integrate data kind of helps us learn these, these different relationships uh, between modalities, again, even though they were measured in different experiments. All right, so, you know, one, one other key question here is, I, I, you know, what are the kind of the requirements for this bridge data set? So, you know, it's, it's important that I've said that, you know, it doesn't have to be very big, but does it have to be thousands of cells? Is a few hundred enough? You know, how big does our bridge data set have to be in order for us to be able to accurately map our ataxy data sets onto our RNA-seq references? Uh, and so we can do a downsampling analysis where we slowly downsample our bridge to be smaller and smaller uh, and see how it affects accuracy. Uh, and so, you know, one of the things that we noticed, of course, is that the accuracy is highest for very large populations and starts to drop for, for rarer and rarer populations, especially for very small bridge sizes. But the question is kind of how many cells do you need in your bridge data set to, to facilitate accurate mapping? And what we find is if you have about 50 cells of your cell type and interest um, in your bridge data set, then that's sufficient to have very accurate mapping. Um, once you start going rarer and rarer than that and kind of smaller and smaller than that, it, it can still be successful. And for, for example, there were only four um, ASDCs that were present in our bridge data set, but we were still able to map them correctly. But once you get to that kind of very rare regime, uh, we start to see um, errors uh, and, and, and errors in that regime as well. So, you know, this is kind of a valuable guide for experimental design. Um, it is quite possible with these multi-domic technologies to generate data sets that have at least 50 cells per cell type. Uh, so hopefully this can help you if you're interested in using this type of approach uh, and thinking about how big your kind of bridge data set needs to be in order to facilitate accurate mapping. Um, we can also do quite a lot of benchmarking with other techniques that aim to accomplish a similar goal. For example, the multi-VI and, and COBOL techniques that both use um, artificial neural networks um, to be able to, 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 to integrate across modalities. I should say, just as a side point, that in general, I find the process of benchmarking um, single cell integration algorithms to be quite frustrating. Uh, because we typically don't have ground truth information, right? We don't know the actual label of an individual cell. Um, these are all sort of computationally inferred from the data. So the lack of ground truth typically makes benchmarking very difficult. But in this case, it's actually uh, possible for us to benchmark with a high degree of accuracy. And the reason is because we can take a multi-omic data set as our test case. So if, if we've measured RNA and, and attack together, we then kind of forget the correspondences and then map the two data sets on top of each other, we know as ground truth which RNA and which attack profile originally came from the same cell. So we can design really quantitative benchmarks with real ground truth information. Uh, and, and we can see that our, our method actually performs quite well across a wide variety of test cases. Um, so just as a side point, for those of you that are working on these types of methods, uh, we really do think these multi-omic measurements are valuable for benchmarking because they when things are really measured in the same cell, uh, that's a ground truth piece of information that you can use for, for estimating accuracy. Um, another thing that I want to highlight, you know, I've talked a lot about RNA and attack as being uh, examples of uh, modalities that can be in integrated together, um, but there are lots of multi-omic technologies that can be used as bridges. Um, so, for example, SiteSeq, as I, as I mentioned, measures RNA and protein together, single cell cut and tag pro, does histone modifications and proteins together. There are technologies that measure methylation and RNA together and even high C and RNA together. So, you know, as these new bridge technologies become available, um, basically, that, that, that broadens the applicability of bridge integration and means that we can now start mapping all sorts of new data um, into single cell RNA-seq references. Uh, so just as, as another example, uh, we took a data set from Joe Ecker's lab uh, where they measured DNA methylation in single cells in the human brain. Um, so actually, DNA methylation is a really interesting modality to measure at single cell resolution, and, and they get actually quite nice clustering uh, uh, from these data sets. Uh, but, but DNA methylation is great for identifying clusters, but it's very difficult to annotate those data. Um, so a lot of the clusters they identified are just labeled dash one, dash two, dash three. We don't really know what those clusters correspond to biologically. Um, earlier this year with the Allen Brain Atlas, we released an azimuth reference of the human cortex, and we annotated that with sort of an authoritative and curated uh, cell ontology that's becoming very standard in the field. Um, and so now using bridge integration, we can map this DNA methylation data onto our single cell RNA-seq reference 
And now, instead of having these kind of difficult to interpret um, cell labels and cell names, uh, we can annotate each of our DNA methylation profiles with the standardized uh, cell ontology, which we think is very valuable. All right, so in the last couple of minutes, I just want to talk about one other kind of really uh, a useful application of dictionary learning for single cell analysis. And it, it has to relate for this kind of problem of doing very large scale integration of single cell RNA-seq data sets. Um, so as many of you are aware, when you're trying to combine uh, multiple single cell RNA-seq uh, data sets together, uh, there can be substantial uh, technical and batch effects. So for example, these are, uh, I think, 13 different papers that published data sets from the human lung. Uh, there's about one, over a million cells uh, in this data set consisting of more than 200 individuals. Um, but of course, cells are clustering very largely by the study that they came from rather than their underlying biological cell type. And there are a variety of methods that can be used to correct for these batch effects and harmonize these profiles. But with the scale of this data, um, for example, many of these methods take over a day uh, to run and, and require you know, enormous amounts of memory and amounts of RAM. Um, so one idea that we actually thought of to sort of speed up this process, you know, we want to be able to integrate eventually hundreds of millions or billions of cells together. We can't just keep buying bigger computers. Um, so we thought it might be one interesting idea, instead of integrating the entire data sets, would be to learn uh, compact dictionaries for each one of the data sets, um, and then just to integrate the dictionaries together. Um, and once we've integrated the dictionaries together, we can then, that can happen in a, in a, in a very scalable and, and quick computational way. Uh, and once we've done that dictionary integration, we can ex then extend very rapidly the results of that integrated analysis to the full data set. So it's kind of a form of data compression. We're compressing each of the data sets, doing the slowest and most complex comp uh, computation on those compressed representations, and then extending those results um, to, the, to the full data sets, back to the full data sets. And we think this is kind of a, an exciting uh, uh, possibility for how we can do very, very large scale um, single cell analysis, especially with, with integration. Um, so now we can take these uh, uh, more than a million cells, we can integrate them very rapidly together. It takes less than 19 minutes um, to use on a standard laptop computer, despite this being uh, quite a large sort of community-wide data set. Um, now cells cluster together, not based on their original study, but based on their shared biological cell type. Um, one kind of cool result is, is that we can see a very small cluster again uh, of a cell uh, type that was very recently discovered called the pulmonary ionocyte. Um, this is a rare cell type. Again, it's less than 0.05% um, of all cells that are present in the lung. It's been discovered in both human and mouse. But if you look at any one individual study, because these cells are so rare, you typically only get, you know, five to 10 of them. Uh, but now that we have so many different studies that we've been able to integrate together, uh, we can consistently identify these pulmonary ionocytes almost, in, in fact, in every data set that we look at. Um, and now that we've been able to identify them reliably across multiple data sets, we can really do a deep dive into their transcriptome and identify both lowly and highly expressed genes uh, that are markers of this particular cell type. And again, we can only do that because now we have uh, quite a large compendium across studies um, of what these pulmonary ionocytes look like. Uh, so when we do that now, all of a sudden, we can see really an enormous enrichment uh, for all sorts of uh, uh, signaling channels and, and ion channels uh, that we think these cells are using uh, to regulate the, the chemical environment. Um, as one very final example in the last couple of minutes, uh, we did the exact same thing um, in, in human PBMC. So we went and we identified uh, in the literature every possible human blood data set that we could find. Um, this corresponds now to, to close to 4 million cells, um, including data sets both from healthy individuals uh, and from patients with COVID-19. Um, so about 3.5 million cells here representing data from over 600, uh, close to 700 different individuals, and we can integrate them all together um, using this uh, dictionary learning approach. Um, what that enables us to do actually is to learn uh, cell type specific responses to COVID-19 that are consistent across multiple studies and multiple individuals. And I won't talk about this more now, but I, again, this ability to, to combine data sets means we can start identifying patterns that are conserved across hundreds of individuals, uh, which is really not something that we could do before. Um, now, that's just single cell RNA-seq. We'd love to be able to add other modalities into that. And in fact, there's been quite a lot of CYTOF gen uh, data generated from, from uh, COVID samples. So CYTOF uh, is a protein panel. Uh, there's no RNA expression. Uh, but we thought that it might be possible for us to integrate uh, our CYTOF data with our single cell RNA-seq reference, again, using bridge integration. Uh, and in this case, we can use CYTOF-seq, uh, where RNA and protein are measured together uh, as a bridge. Um, so that's what we've done here. Uh, and so now what we can do is we can view and visualize the expression of intracellular proteins uh, on single cell RNA-seq defined clusters uh, for the first time. Uh, so for example, the expression of granzyme B, which is an intracellular protein that was measured via CYTOF, uh, we can see exactly in which single cell RNA-seq defined clusters is that expressed. We can see high expression in cytotoxic CD8 cells uh, and NK cells, but a very specific depletion of NCD56 bright NK cells. Um, so there's, there's some fun immunology that will come out of this. I'll, I'll skip over that for now. And, 
and just conclude by, by telling you that I, I've told you about a method um, for robust and accurate cross-modality integration uh, called bridge integration. Uh, a really key thing to keep in mind for bridge integration is that we are not making any assumptions about the relationships between different cellular modalities. We can map attack data onto RNA data, but we never assume that just because a locus is open at the chromatin level, it should be expressed transcriptomically. Those complex relationships are learned instead in an unbiased way through this bridge data set where RNA and attack are measured together. Uh, one nice thing about bridge integration is it can be very flexibly applied to a diverse set of technologies. Um, it's compatible with small and medium-sized uh, bridge data sets. Um, and actually, just to, to end in the last you know, 20 seconds, is, is I think it raises an interesting question of you know, how do we collect big, massive multiomic references? Uh, do we have to run multiomic technologies on every data set that we on, on, on every sample that we have? Or instead, maybe we can just uh, use those multiomic technologies on a subset of our samples uh, and then use those multiomic uh, profiles as bridges uh, to integrate the remaining data sets together. Uh, if that's possible, which we think it is, that represents maybe a very cost-effective, uh, high-quality, and highly scalable way of doing cross-modality analysis. All right, so I think I'm out of time, so I'll wrap up there. I particularly want to thank uh, Yuhan Hao, uh, who's led uh, the computational side of this work. There's also been uh, contributions from a number uh, of, of others in the lab, including Tim Stewart and Avi Strivastava and many others. Uh, thanks very much for listening, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, Rahul, for a uh, fantastic talk. So questions? Hi, Rahul. Thanks very much. That was a great talk. Um, I'm interested in the pseudo time analysis. Once you've got the dictionary learning done and you've now mapped between these two data types, are you projecting from like RNA into the attack space or vice versa, or are you projecting both into a latent space yes. for the pseudo time uh, analysis? That's a great question. So we are projecting, but you, you actually can't, it's kind of up to the user. Um, so if you'd like, you can map the attack data onto the RNA. If you'd like, you can map the RNA data onto attack. Typically, you'll make that decision if you believe that one of the data sets is of higher quality or is can really be treated as a reference and the other as a query. Um, but you don't have to do that. In, in this case, we actually embedded uh, both of the modalities um, into a shared latent space without assuming that either one of them was correct, for example. Um, and then once we had that shared representation, uh, we constructed it, we, we ran the diffusion the map, dimensional reduction procedure uh, in order to calculate pseudo time. Uh, so it's, it really is kind of an effect to jointly embed cells from multiple modalities together uh, and then learn kind of a broader structure, which, is, which in this case represents a, a, a differentiation trajectory. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think so. Is the shared space defined by the dictionary elements or is that a separate thing from the dictionary? That's right. The shared space is defined by these dictionary elements. So it's not particularly interpretable, right? It's not like you can look at that shared that, that, at any individual number and, and kind of make sense of that. It's not like being defined by a gene or defined by a peak. Um, but the point is, the important thing is that both of the modalities are defined by the same space and we can use that for manifold learning. Yeah. Great. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I think. Uh, uh, Data integration is very important, but uh, could you tell us when data integration doesn't work, what is the uh, like things we have to consider when we integrate like data from different modality? I need to say the bad things, right? The, the, the side, the other side. Yeah. So you know, there there are. This is a another way of asking your question is: Could you, for example, integrate diseased and healthy samples? Could you, for example, use a bridge data set that you collected in one tissue to perform integration in another? Right. Um, so so typically the integration performs. You know, I hope that the integration performs well when you are integrating samples where the same biological subtypes are observed. Uh, where the method starts to become more complicated is when you're integrating data sets where there, for example populations that are present in one data set that are, that are missing from another. So if we think about sort of the assumptions that the method is making, I, I find this very helpful to kind of, at least intellectually, kind of get a sense of, of how well the method is going to work. We are making an assumption, right, that the bridge data set is capable of reconstructing the individual modality data sets. So if your bridge data set is from a completely different tissue, then it's not going to be able to successfully reconstruct those individual data sets, and, and you're going to have errors in, in your downstream output, right? Um, However, we have repeatedly found that uh, uh, data sets from healthy individuals can be used to interpret as, as reference mapping, and it's not just us, many in the field do this, uh, can be used to, for example, to reconstruct uh, data sets from disease individuals. So it's not that it's a perfect one-to-one -one match, 
Uh, but the, 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 the similarity between the cell types is great enough that that reconstruction process can happen accurately. Now, it'd be great if I could give you a single number. Uh, we, do, we do certainly have metrics. Uh, so if, we're, if, for example, there are cell populations that are present um, in the query data set that are not present in the reference, uh, you know, we do uh, return a, a confidence score or a metric associated with each of our predictions. Um, and we repeatedly shown that when uh, any of our integrative processes fail, that those confidence scores are lower. Um, but none of these none of these metrics are perfect, right? Like it's possible that it's not quite clear what that confidence score cutoff is going to be to determine high quality integration. Um, and so those those remain ongoing challenges for the field, um, both for for our methods and for others. Um, but again, it, yeah. Mm -hmm, go ahead. Uh, so, I, I, but I think it's always helpful to, to really go back and, and think about the underlying assumptions that these methods are making. Um, and if those methods, uh, if those assumptions are biologically relevant for your data, then typically we do see very strong performance uh, for these methods. Uh, for the sake of time, we'll take uh, two last questions from the audience in the room. Thank you for a fascinating talk. Uh, you mentioned that would be a good uh, bridge dictionary that it would have at least a certain number of of each cell set. When integrating data sets, uh, have you noticed any requirements or any effect of uh, a minimum a number of cell types in each data set? Or is what's important just that you have that minimum number across all the data sets? Yeah, so uh, there's no requirement for there to be a certain number of cell types overall. Um, but again, what's important is that it's, it's that you're able to reconstruct your data sets from the dictionary. Um, so if you have uh, what we've noticed, and as I showed, if you have at least 50 cells per cell type uh, in your dictionary, then that's enough kind of redundancy to be very confident uh, that you can uh, accurately reconstruct your, your full data set from the dictionary itself. Um, but that number is, you know, that, that's it's, it's a very good rule of thumb. Uh, but of course, if you have very deep data, if you have a very, very deeply sequenced dictionary, you're likely to be able to get away with far fewer than 50 cells. 50 is a lot of redundancy, right? But we sometimes need that if we have very sparse data. So it's, it's not like it's a hard and fast number of exactly 50, but that's a good rule of thumb. But it is related more to kind of the overall uh, redundancy of the data set more than the total number of clusters, if that makes sense. Thank you. Hi, thank you for taking the talk. And for, I was particularly interested in this leg between the ataxic and realistic. I was wondering, did you um, find enough of such cases that you can actually reconstruct the regulatory mechanisms and maybe be yeah, you know, find the transcription factors and you can actually go back to RNA and yeah, I just wasn't yeah. I think this is really cool, right? Like this, this idea that there are some genes where there's a lag and some genes that there are not, and there are presumably distinct transcriptional modes, right? Uh, and or transcriptional regulatory network that, that govern this kind of transcriptional poisoning. Um, so we do see an enrichment in the few hundred cases that I showed you uh, for, for cell cycle transcription factors like E2, E2F1. Um, which is consistent with the idea that those are kind of bound or at least accessible um, to promote the, the, the spread of the cell cycle. Um, I don't think we've pushed this very far, though, and I do think this is a really active and exciting area for, for my group and others um, to use these kind of multimodal data sets uh, to be able to understand regulatory relationships across modalities. And I, I hope that one of the things that bridge integration will help us do is to be able to sort of build those kind of multimodal profiles, even if we can't measure everything in the same experiment. So it's a great question and something we're very excited about.